This is the Grolo Tower. Rising to a height of 580 meters, it would have been the world's tallest building from its estimated completion in the early 2000s until 2010, when the Burj Khalifa would have overtaken it. But for some reason, the people of Melbourne, Australia said no to this record-breaking feat of engineering that would have brought international recognition to the city. To understand this, we need to start in the year 1995. The world's tallest building is the 442-metre Sears Tower in Chicago, USA. The 110-storey behemoth has held the top spot for 22 years since 1973, is home to the headquarters of some of the world's biggest companies, and is a major tourist attraction due to its observation deck. However, a plan has been formulated 15,000 kilometres away in Melbourne to end the reign of the Sears Tower. The plan was the brainchild of property developer and businessman Bruno Grollo. Grollo was the director of the construction company Grocon, which was founded in 1948 by Grollo's Italian immigrant father Luigi. Grocon was the main contractor responsible for the construction of Australia's tallest building at the time, the 265 metre 120 Collins Street, which was completed in 1991 in Melbourne. However, Bruno Grollo was not satisfied with being the builder of Australia's tallest building. He had ambitions to be the builder of the world's tallest building. And thus, the idea of Grollo Tower was born. The original concept for a 580 meter tall Grollo Tower was developed in 1995 by renowned architect Harry Seidler. Seidler is best known for designing Sydney's 170 meter tall Australia Square Tower which was the nation's tallest building from 1967 to 1975. Despite its name, Australia's Square Tower is actually very much circular. Harry Seidler and his firm publicly released multiple 3D renders and 2D drawings of their Grollo Tower design, allowing us to recreate it in 3D and analyze it in detail. The building was planned to be located above decommissioned railway lines to the east of Melbourne CBD and towards the world-famous Melbourne Cricket Ground. Visitors to the tower are greeted with a massive cantilevered glass awning. A water feature curves its way through the tower's expansive lobby, which is completely open to the elements and has a 15 meter high ceiling. A bank of 45 elevators is the key to exploring the tower's 120 storeys. We'll take the elevator to the 60th floor, a typical office floor halfway up the tower. The hexagonal floors are fully open with no internal columns, allowing for the most efficient use of space and unobstructed 360 degree views of Melbourne through the floor to ceiling windows. Such columnless internal spaces are extremely desirable in premium office spaces and are only possible through the specialized structure of the Grollo Tower. The structure consists of six triangular columns positioned at the corners of the hexagonal slabs and a triangular core positioned in the center. The columns and the core are the vertical support elements responsible for transferring the massive weight of the tower to the earth below with the concrete slabs spanning between these two elements. The span of these slabs can be up to 20 meters at the lowest levels. This span reduces with the height of the tower since the size of the floor plate decreases. These slabs require post tensioning, which is the process of laying tensioned steel cables within the slab at specific curved profiles, resulting in a slab that is thinner and has less deflection than a traditional reinforced slab. Diagonal bracing members integrated into the building's facade provide support to the edges of the slab, transferring the loads into the columns. These bracing members also double as an architectural feature, breaking up the dazzling sunset orange facade. While the core is essential for housing the building's 45 elevator shafts, several mechanical, electrical and plumbing services, and fire escape stairs, it also plays an integral role in supporting the tower against lateral loads caused by wind and earthquakes. The key to dealing with lateral loads in the skyscraper is to have sections of wall with significant length parallel to the direction of incoming lateral loads, known as shear walls. Unlike columns, these shear walls have a high moment of inertia with regards to lateral loading which is a property that quantifies a structure's ability to resist bending. The easiest way to visualize this is to think about bending a ruler. 
When the width of the ruler is perpendicular to the applied load, the ruler has a low moment of inertia and thus bends with ease. However, if you rotate the ruler such that its width is parallel to the applied load, you've increased its moment of inertia and it becomes much harder to bend. At the ground level, the triangular core consists of 50 meter long sidewalls, along with numerous smaller rectangular cells for the elevator shafts. The result is an extremely stiff core which can handle lateral loads coming from any direction. For a structure of this height and located in a seismically inactive region like Melbourne, wind would cause more demanding loads than earthquakes. Wind loads acting on the building's facade are transferred to the floor plates before travelling to the core. A small amount of the wind load travels through the facade bracing members to the columns. However, the vast majority of the lateral load is attracted to the core, which has a stiffness orders of magnitude larger than the columns. In general, wind loads increase with a building's height because wind speeds are higher at greater elevations. This is because there are less obstructions, such as terrain, buildings and trees at greater elevations, allowing wind to flow unobstructed and at higher speeds. However, the tower's core actually decreases in size and thus stiffness at higher levels. At first, this seems counterintuitive. Shouldn't the core be larger where the loads are highest? However, the core is a cantilever structure. Its base is fixed to the earth and its top is unsupported. In a cantilever structure, the bending stresses are maximum at the fixed base and reduce parabolically to zero stress at the unsupported end. As such, the core size can reduce with the height of the building since the required stiffness is less. Since the size of the tower's floor plan reduces with height, a product of its architectural taper, it is beneficial for the core size to reduce, as it means the core will take up less space on the floor plan, allowing for more space for commercial and residential activity. Less elevators are also needed for the higher floors, since a smaller proportion of the building's occupants need to access them. The hexagonal shape of the tower is also beneficial in reducing wind loads. A square-shaped building can have a drag coefficient in the order of 80% higher than that of a hexagonally shaped building and thus experience significantly higher wind loads. This makes intuitive sense since a hexagon is closer to a circle, which is obviously more streamlined than a square. You'll also notice several floors of the tower near the base are open to the elements, with only a cylinder in the centre. These are the mechanical floors which contain the machinery required for the building's electricity, air conditioning and plumbing. These open floors allow wind to blow through the building rather than acting on the facade, resulting in a significant reduction in lateral loading on these floors. Although these open floors only account for 5% of the building's total height, such a reduction in loading would still allow the building's core to be slightly smaller, increasing the usable area. A particularly famous example of these open wind passages can be found in New York City's incredibly slender 432 Park Avenue. The Grolo Tower has 300,000 square meters of usable area, just shy of the Burj Khalifa's 310,000 square meters. A mix of both office and residential spaces, there are cafes, restaurants and an observation deck at the top of the tower, with the 120th floor reserved for a mechanical plant. A unique feature of the Grolo Tower is its roof, which is covered with solar panels. The 4,600 square meter solar array is the size of approximately 18 tennis courts. While this is an impressive size, such a solar array would only be able to meet roughly 15% of the building's electricity requirements under ideal sunlight conditions. The roof is oriented such that the solar panels are facing north, which is the ideal direction for the southern hemisphere. However, aesthetics have been prioritised over efficiency for the roof angle. At 47 degrees, the roof is tilted more than the ideal angle of 38 degrees for Melbourne and suffers a 1% loss in efficiency as a result. Finally, it's worth noting that the tower is only 500 metres to the top of the 120th floor mechanical space. 
Its 580 meter height is achieved by the communication spire, whose slenderness and slight tilt is made possible by propping it back to the roof. The Grolo Tower would have been the world's tallest building with an architecturally stunning design that would have put Melbourne on the map. So why was it never built? The answer is due to a lack of support from the public. Polling suggested that only 40% of the public supported the design, with 48% in opposition. A proposal which would have such a drastic impact on Melbourne's skyline was going to require a far higher approval rating from the public. However, Bruno Grollo wasn't going to give up on his dream of building the world's tallest building that easily. He went back to the drawing board, releasing a new design in late 1995 with the help of the architecture studio Denton Corker Marshall. The initial proposal for Denton's design was a 680 metre tall building, however this was scaled back to 560 metres. Unfortunately for Mr Grollo, the new tower design no longer bore his name. It was to be known simply as the Melbourne Tower. Less detailed information is available on this design, since no floor plans or elevations have ever been publicly released, although it's still possible for us to recreate a simplified model of the building based on 3D renders released by the studio. This 560 metre design was to be located in Melbourne's Docklands precinct to the west of the CBD. Formerly a busy industrial centre as part of the Port of Melbourne, Docklands was becoming abandoned in the 1990s and there were plans to redevelop it commercially. There are many similarities between the designs of Harry Seidler and Denton Corker Marshall. Both towers begin in the same fashion, with a massive open to the elements lobby allowing access to countless elevators. However, in the new design, the lobby ceiling height has increased to 50 metres, meaning even first floor tenants will have impressive views. If we travel to one of the typical floors, we will see it is again entirely columnless, allowing the most efficient use of space. The square floor plates are supported by eight square columns at the corners of the building, which taper in size towards the top. There are four external elevators nestled between the tower columns. The elevators have a glass exterior, giving visitors a dynamic view of Melbourne as they ascend towards the observation deck. The lateral system consists of a central core and steel bracing members in the facade, with the core reducing in size with height to maximise usable floor space. The biggest difference between the towers is at the top, where the Seidler design had a spire, the Denton design has an 108 metre tall void acting as a beacon. In this region, the facade continues to the full 560 metre height of the building, while the floor plates stop at 450 metres. This empty volume houses a powerful lighting installation. The light bounces around the facade glass, transforming the top of the tower into a glowing beacon. One challenge with this beacon is that the concrete core would not extend all the way to the top of the tower. As such, the beacon must be able to support itself laterally. Normally, this would not be a problem for a lightweight steel tower. Wind gusts travel through the gaps between the steel members, minimizing the destabilizing wind load. However, the facade glass is continuous to the top of the building, meaning the exposed surface area of the structure is orders of magnitude higher than that of the steelwork alone, and thus the resulting wind loads are much higher. To resist these loads without the help of a stiff concrete core, the beacon features a number of circular steel members in the form of struts and angled bracing members between the tower columns. The effect is to create several lines of lateral support in both directions, without the need for the long shear walls of a concrete core. If you combine the tower's 50 metre tall lobby and 108 metre tall beacon, nearly 30% of the tower's total height is unusable void space. This is by design. 
The Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, the world leading authority on skyscrapers, still counts this so called vanity height above the highest occupied floor when ranking buildings by height. At the same time, less usable floor area means the building developers would be able to minimize the amount invested into car parks, elevators, and other associated infrastructure that adds nothing to the building's height. The Denton design was received more favorably by both the public and architectural experts. In fact, 200 people had paid $5,000 deposits to reserve an apartment in the tower. However, three main issues would arise with the proposal. The first concern was the immense shadow that the tower would cast over the city of Melbourne. Newspapers made claims that the tower would cast a 10 kilometer long shadow and used exaggerated diagrams to influence the public opinion against the tower. For 20 minutes every afternoon, the shadow also would have fallen on South Bank and Collins Street, two of Melbourne's most heavily developed precincts. While Melbourne isn't a cold city by international standards, it's Australia's second coldest capital city after Hobart. As such, a lack of sunlight would cause discomfort for citizens enjoying outdoor spaces on winter afternoons. Secondly, the Melbourne Tower would also cause issues for the flight paths of Melbourne Airport, despite it being nearly 20 kilometres away. The Civil Aviation Safety Authority estimated that if the tower was built, a new airport runway would have to be built a decade earlier than anticipated due to disruption to flight paths needing to avoid the tower. The final issue was that of a 385 meter long unused train shed on the site. The number two goods shed, which was part of the now defunct shipping operation in Docklands, was built in 1889, making it nearly 110 years old at the time, and was at one point Australia's longest building. As such, conservation groups opposed its demolition to make way for the tower. To appease these groups, the shed would be integrated into an updated design as part of recreational facilities at the base of the tower. Quite fitting that Australia's former longest building would make way for its tallest. The tower was finally approved by the Victorian government in late 1998 after a gruelling three-year battle. The only thing standing in the way of the start of construction and the first piles being driven into the ground was a $37 million payment for the land. While this may seem like a lot, the construction cost of the tower was estimated at $2 billion, so this land purchase was less than 2% of the total investment. However, Grolo's company was reluctant to make the payment in full and instead offered $17 million in cash up front with the remaining $20 million at a later date. This proposal was rejected by the authorities and Melbourne's dream to host the world's tallest building was officially dead. However, not all hope was lost for Bruno Grollo. In 2003, he signed a deal with Emirati property developers Imar Properties to construct the world's tallest building in Dubai using the Denton design. You're probably familiar with this building, which is now known as the Burj Khalifa. However, in the end, Grollo had nothing to do with this building. The Denton design was rejected in favor of a design by American firm Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. One possible explanation for this is that a detailed wind tunnel analysis of the square-shaped Denton design might have shown it to be insufficiently streamlined to handle the expected wind loads. Especially given the final height of the Burj Khalifa is 268 meters taller than the Melbourne Tower. The iconic curved three-pronged Skidmore design is able to direct wind gusts away from the tower without absorbing these loads. So that concludes the story of why the city of Melbourne said no to the world's tallest building, not once, but twice. Remember the century-old train shed that the Melbourne Tower was going to split in half? In 2005, it met the same fate as Collins Street was expanded from Melbourne CBD towards Docklands. It was redeveloped in 2010, coincidentally by a subsidiary of Grolo's construction company, 
and is now home to various offices and a restaurant, still retaining its original brick exterior. And across the Yarra River stand the 317 metre Australia 108 and the 297 metre Eureka Tower, Australia's second and third tallest buildings respectively. In fact, both of these skyscrapers are actually taller to the roof than the nation's tallest building, Q1. However, Q1 Spire positions it slightly ahead of Australia 108 at 322 metres. Regardless of whether or not you believe Melbourne made the right decision in rejecting the Grolo Tower, you cannot deny it would have made a lasting impact on both the city's skyline and its history. Thank you so much for watching and let me know in the comments which of the two designs is your favourite.